a masterpiece of ancient architecture, a grandiose monument, a record-breaking achievement of its time, and still there after 2,000 years of existence. The Pont du Gard is studied with superlatives, in terms of construction as the highest bridge of its time because of its ingenious design. In short, the Pont du Gard fascinates more than ever. More than a million and a half visitors come to stroll across its central aisle each year, experiencing the last surviving bridge of the Roman world with these dimensions. We're in southern France, near the city of Nîmes. Here, between two cliffs, abundant forests, and a river as limpid as it is indomitable, depending on the day, arises this ancient giant of a bridge. At 49 meters high, 275 meters long, and with 64 arches on three levels, one of which ranks as the largest of all antiquity, the Pont du Gard is one of the most impressive emblems of the Roman era still standing. To understand the challenge posed by the project, one of the most daring civil engineering works in the world, we must go back in time, into the first century AD. Back then, the whole region is under Roman rule. Its capital, Nîmes, was founded by the local Celtic tribe. Throughout the empire, cities looked to Rome as a model. So people adopted the Roman way of life, its administration, its monuments. When we speak of Romanization, that's precisely what we mean. And the key element to turn Nîmes into a true Roman city is water. Water was a symbol of luxury, power and wealth. What is sought after above all is to have water brought to you via pressure, up to the highest floors of a building where those in power reside. The baths, which were immensely popular among Romans, also require an immense amount of water, much more than could be provided by the source under the city of Nîmes. We know that a citizen of Nîmes, Wandumukas Arthur, had an important office in Rome. He was the water curator, meaning he was responsible for all water management in Rome and beyond. And for Arthur, the solution to the problem of bringing water in sufficient quantity to the city of Nîmes is the construction of an aqueduct, a kind of a long pipe wherein water can flow from point A to point B. So they choose a source at high ground, and thanks to the slope, the gravity, its water will flow until it reaches the cisterns of the city. In this case, the source is near Uzès, about 50 kilometers from Nîmes. This may sound quite a stretch, yet distance is not a handicap. The Romans have already built aqueducts of over 90 kilometers. It's the minimal incline between the two cities that poses the actual problem. The difference in height between the points of departure and arrival is merely 12.6 meters. So the average slope of this aqueduct is 25 centimeters per kilometer. That's tiny. Therefore, to achieve a steady incline, accurate calculations are called for. Yet there's another obstacle. Along the course of the aqueduct, it's necessary to cross the Garden Valley, which is particularly deep. Through scrublands, forests, or even using tunnels, Roman aqueducts generally pass everywhere. But to pass over a river, the waters of which can rise to 15 meters, while maintaining an incline that is neither too steep nor too flat, is quite a different matter. So the Romans opted to build a singularly high bridge. A bridge high enough to take the aqueduct to the other side of the gorges of the Gardon River. Yet the water curator, Dumucus Arthur, is ready to raise what seems at the time a crazy gamble, to build the highest bridge the world has seen up until then. It's actually three bridges on top of each other. The top one contains the speakers, the pipe itself. A bridge like that will require a gigantic site. Yet the first task is to find a quarry capable of providing enough rocks of adequate quality. And it is less than 600 meters away. The biggest blocks cut here weigh up to six tons and will be built into the piers of the bridge. 
However, tools are rudimentary. Picks and pickaxes. It's all well and good to cut stones into shape, but to put them in place, you have to find solutions for lifting and handling. This is when wheel and winch make their appearance on the site. It's an ingenious lifting system from the maritime world. One, two or more men are placed inside a wheel and start walking. A rope connected to a winch allows their force to be multiplied and to lift blocks of several tons. American colleagues experimented with three or four students inside the wheel. They raised several tons that way. It's exhausting work done by slaves. This way, dozens of blocks come out of the quarry every week. They're put on barges that are towed upstream. The blocks are then placed on rollers and pushed onto the large artificial platform that serves as the base of the site. The stones arrived as crude extractions from the quarry. They were finished here on this large surface, which had been smoothed with gravel, so as to allow assembling the blocks with great precision. It's here that the blocks are given their final shape, right down to the last millimeter. The Romans used to rub the stones against each other so they fitted perfectly. They also used abrasive red sand to achieve perfect alignment. It's absolutely essential to have a surface of maximum friction. The stones must not move. Assembling the finished blocks amounted to a kind of puzzle. Each block was given a number. Some still show the traces of the engraved figures. Then they were put into place as if it were a piece of furniture. The procedure is called dry assembly. There's no mortar between the blocks. Their mass and the perfection of their size keeps them in place. Two blocks are brought into position, one on top of the other. And almost immediately they sit as tightly as if they had never been separated. You couldn't even slip a cigarette paper between them. It's impossible. The actual construction begins with the largest arches. The heaviest blocks are placed first. Then a wooden arch, called a formwork, is erected on this base. This allows the stones to be assembled. As long as the final stone is not yet there, the masonry is not under tension. And obviously, if you remove the formwork, everything will collapse. So the final stone is the keystone. The highest arch is the one that spans the river proper. It's 24.5 meters wide, the largest of all arches built in the Roman Empire. Its neighbors are about 20 meters wide. There are six of them at the base of the bridge. To continue the work and to add two more levels, the architects used a technique the traces of which are still visible. On all levels, you can see blocks that are protruding, most likely to hang the scaffolding. These blocks, called headers, are on each side of the bridge. They probably also serve to maintain the balance, the stability of the whole edifice, since they are quite long and traverse the piers from both ends. On the first and second levels, you have the big ones. These blocks are truly enormous. Transporting, finishing and finally lifting them into place must have taken several weeks. It's estimated that one block weighs the equivalent of five cars. Up on the third level, there's a small covered canal built from rubble. The stones here are about 40 centimeters thick. The canal constitutes the strategic part of the bridge, that of an aqueduct. It has a constant width of 1.35 meters. The walls are made of crushed tiles mixed with lime, which makes them completely waterproof. 
Usually we find this in public baths, in the basins, as you don't want the water to seep into the ground, unlike in sewers where the walls are left bare. So here they plastered the walls with concrete. A waterproofing layer on the sides, but curiously, not on the floor of the aqueduct. Well, we don't know what happened, but obviously somebody made a mistake and forgot to have the bottom covered with concrete. The result is leaks and damage to the upper parts of the bridge. Another problem must have appeared early on. Sometimes too much water would cause overflows since the walls of the aqueduct were not high enough so ever more water seeped into the masonry of the bridge. The problem also resulted from the incline of the overall aqueduct. The slope of the ducts north of the bridge was too steep, causing thousands of cubic meters of water to rush onto the bridge. As the water overflowed the top of the Pont du Gard, they had to get back to work and raise the aqueduct over a stretch of about six kilometers to avoid two violent overflows. Another explanation for the rapid degradation of the stones is their quality. When you build, you favor hard stones at the base. Further up, you may use soft stone and maybe firmer stone for anything to do with decoration. Yet all that will undergo degradation, erosion by rain or wind. So you tend to avoid using soft stone. Yet the Pont du Gard is made exclusively of soft stone. Soft stones are easy to cut with simple tooth saws, but they absorb water because of their porosity. And that's a real problem when you know that the arches of the bridge will have their feet in the water during the notorious floods of the region. One of the characteristics of the Gardon is that it's a Mediterranean watercourse. So it will have a more or less regular oscillation between extreme weather situations. For instance, severe droughts in summer. And there are periods of violent and devastating floods, which generally occur between September and October. In 2002, torrential rains fell on the Gar region the equivalent of eight months in a single day. As the river turns into a torrent, the lower arches of the bridge are almost underwater. Yet these floods were taken into account right from the beginning and pushed the architects to establish a record for their times. The Romans positioned piers on both banks of the river and spanned it with a single arch, yet that forced them to erect an arch more than 25 meters wide, which is quite exceptional. The Pont du Gard has a lot of openings, so it lets in a lot of water. However, that's why it can withstand floods considerably better, since there is less internal pressure on the arches compared to bridges built with much smaller ones. Another problem caused by the floods is that everything carried along by the rushing water can damage the piers of the bridge. Projections are thus positioned on each pier, downstream as well as upstream of the bridge. These prows will deflect the current to pass along the sides. The projections provided the finishing touch to the work. Four years have been necessary to span the river. Despite its problems of water tightness, the aqueduct served the city of Nîmes for over 450 years. Then it was abandoned. But it could have suffered a worse fate. After the fall of the Roman Empire, the ends or abutments of the aqueduct served as a quarry for the inhabitants of the area to build houses or churches. Yet the Pont du Gard as a whole was spared. Since 1985, it joined the UNESCO World Heritage List. The Pont du Gard, a masterpiece of the Roman era, had long been the only architectural showpiece of the region.